First of all, I wanted to say good morning. What's the matter? Okay, it's okay. Oh, it's all right. It's 10 o'clock, and my go there group on Palestine. They're having a panel, and they're going to be speaking after me, so I do want to use the time. And um, My name is Barbara, and um, first of all, I want to ask you how you're all doing this morning. Everybody's so full of energy. <laughs> okay, and I want to say, look at the mess we're in. I want everybody to look at each other. You don't have to. And say, hi, comrade. Look at the mess we're in. Hi, comrade. Look at the mess we're in. Well, not in this room, but you. Okay. And the reason why that, to me, is important is because it goes to being aware of the people around us, all the people that are going through the oppressions as a result of a system that is in the death agony, which is capitalism. Um, okay, so I want a quick survey too. How many of you would label yourself as a feminist or a, se you know, there, okay. And how many would label yourself as a woman? Sorry, men. <laughs> and how many would label yourself, I mean, would call yourselves a, um, a woman socialist or a socialist or more socialist? Okay, okay. So anyway, the reason I decided to do this talk, not because I don't want to talk to you, <laughs> is because during the past few months, I'm very impassioned by the issue of women's rights. During the past several months, I have been doing research on, you know, more and more on um, how women are in our culture have evolved and um, fighting, as we fight for our rights in a sea of patriarchy, and it's a hierarchy too, um, which began about 10,000 years ago. Um, that was at the advent of the class, the beginning of the development of class society as we know. Okay? Along with the structural changes which happened, we also had the development, the emergence of monotheistic religious institutions. And as we know, many of those, those religious institutions go to the fact of the hierarchy of patriarchism. Um, for example, we, God the Father, um, men being, like in Judaism, being born, you know, it, it, with Judaism, it's like, I am born as um, the son of the image of God. God, a man is, you know, is in the Christianity when they talk about, it's a young people. Okay, so anyway, it kind of gives the idea that when Eve ate the apple, you know, he was the image of God, Adam, and when Eve ate the apple, she then was responsible for the sins of the world, which I think is an early beginning of a sort of a sense of that women were actually blamed for everything. And you see that happening in a lot of, in the systemic view of capitalism, and you see it happening in patriarchal uh, families, nuclear families, okay? So, um, I also want to talk about the attitude, norms, and values of popular materialistic cultures that help to shape and legitimize and reinforce those beliefs. I'm sure we are all familiar with turning on the television and you see what? You see beautiful, sexy women who are behind the cars behind them. And it's very subliminal. And for all of us who grew up in the 60s, perhaps, knowing that we saw those ads on TV, you know, we get a total distortion. It goes to the sexual object to objectification of women and the sexual commodification of women as that developed. And then ironically, the Constitution came up at the same time as the nuclear family. Um, suppose, you know, I believe this too, that prostitution is the other side of the coin for monogamy. I heard a man once say, his words were, um, well, being married is like paying a lifelong prostitute. You know, the idea that he was supporting her was the same thing as going out and paying a prostitute, except that there was this relationship. And, um, okay, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the development of classism. Um, Engels wrote in the book, The Origin, as many of you might be familiar with, about how class society emerged. And that involves the actual development 
of historical materialism because Marx and Engels viewed the world from a materialistic viewpoint. It's not that they didn't have ideas about how to change the world, but they viewed it from that point. Because as the means of production, as, as okay, we'll start out with May, I'm getting off. As the matriarchal society, which was early primitive communist, okay, that was when the women were more involved, and they, not more involved, they were equal within the societies. Women were the hunter-gatherer societies. And so then you have the hunter-gatherer. So women in those societies, everybody took care of the kids. Talk about daycare. Everybody took care of them. And, and they worked together. But they were smaller groups of people. And the needs were, their needs, their basic needs at that time was just production for use. We need food, we need the basic essentials, so production for use, and there was no surplus. And um, the Iroquois Indians, I think there was a man, a gentleman named Henry, or Louis Henry Morgan, who was the, an anthropologist who actually, um, what he did was he did, he sat with the Iroquois and then he traveled all over to other societies, and as an anthropologist studied these societies, and, and uh, you know, saw the matriarchal aspect. Although I have to say, uh, it was amended. Uh, some of what Engel said has changed as far as evidence and data. Like they found out that the Iroquois Indians were really horticulturalists. And so therefore, what does that mean? You know, they probably weren't matriarchal, but there were definitely societies that were, and there's evidence of that. So, okay, what happened was, it is then it went to, about 10,000 years ago, there was slavery feudal, and then there was agricultural society. And at that time, agricultural society was where, you know, women were no longer really, in essence, they were, you know, having babies, and they didn't see it as, at that time, as, as good as, let's say, as constructive for the organized society to bring the babies out in the fields and work with the cattle, because it was this is the invention of animal husbandry, and also it relates to um, the agricultural part of it. And they didn't see it as essential to bringing, uh, you know, the women out there, and, um, and the women sort of just went along and they started staying at home. It was still kind of an extended family situation where women were very involved, you know, in raising the family, but um, they weren't out there doing production. So they were doing reproduction more. And they were also making crafts and things like that, okay? So um, that so what happened in that agricultural society was that as more tools, plows, and all those things were developed, that meant there was more, what, production, more products produced. What happens? There's a surplus. Surplus means that there is extra amount of goods and what to do with it. Well, because the, the sort of the tools of production and production went into the hands of men, men took over the ownership of the surplus. And that was the beginning of the fall of women in terms of power and wealth. Because as we were, you know, staying home, they also needed more production through workers. So as the workers went, you know, as the women were having babies, they were then used to go into the fields and help to produce more. So it became just sort of, a, it's just sort of like the impression was inherent in the system as it developed. Okay, so then, then we go to industrial banking capitalism. I mean, remember, there were, there were thousands of years of this process taking place. It wasn't like it suddenly went from this to this. In fact, it's always, always usually unequal and combined. And um, so what happened was, at the turn of the century, there was a lot of, a lot of stuff about um, what happened at the turn of the century. There was a lot of stuff about industrial capitalism, and that was very essential to you know factories, and cities, because populations were growing, and um, a lot of people came over from other countries. We wanted immigrants at that time, and now you know what we're doing with immigrants, right? Deporting them. We want them to disappear. But, it's, but that was the time when they wanted the immigrant population and they allowed them in. And my grandparents were part of that immigrant population that arrived in 1922. But the first immigrants, there were like 2,251 immigrants that arrived at Ellis Island in 1900, okay? 
Um, and then I think it grew to like 389,000 in 1901, and then it went up to 1 million immigrants came here by the year 1907. So, you know, that's a huge amount of immigrants, which also, and these were mostly unskilled workers, and also were, you know, goes to the issue of spreading the factories and growing, growing among them all over. And women became part of that workforce. I mean, women sort of, you know, at that time, but also this gave, no, actually it wasn't them, I'm sorry. This gave rise to the nuclear family. And why that's important is that women's issue is, because I see the nuclear family myself in my own way as very oppressive, very isolating, very lonely at times. Um, I don't see it as, that was my own personal experience. As Mark said, our social being determines our consciousness. So what you know and what you experience is determines how you think and feel and react. And so because of that, if you grow up in a nuclear family where a mother and father are not healthy, your ability to maybe grow and self-actualize may be very limited. So we are limited by the constraints of that isolated family. And that's important to know. Also, the patriarchism. See, I see the nuclear family and its patriarchal hierarchy as sort of a smaller molecule of the broader system of capitalism, where it's also a systemic system, a systemic abuse that goes on and oppresses peoples, black people and, and uh, women and immigrants. So I see that as a total, um, like I, you could compare, here's the nuclear family and here's the bigger hierarchy. And you see how, for example, in my case, my, my grandmother and grandfather were Orthodox Jews, okay? And this is how my consciousness developed, okay? Because you all have your own consciousness that developed for whatever reason. And my consciousness developed because my mother had mental illness. Um, <clears throat> somewhere in the family there had been, on the mother's side, mental illness. And my mother had mental illness. She had suffered from schizophrenia. And the, the early stage of my life, from one to three, I'm living with a woman who's very psychotic or has this illness. But you know, I don't have the cognitive abilities as a child to know this. So it develops into what they call neural dysregulation. But without going into that, I developed DID. Is anyone familiar with DID? It's Dissociative Identity Disorder, okay? I did integrate later. I'm all one right now, guys. <laughs> And I was like, okay, so here's the thing. So I went through my life with this disassociative identity disorder. And I saw in my family, one thing I could never understand through my life was that, so I set myself up in abusive relationships because of my trauma. So I kept going from one abusive man to another abusive man. Not that they weren't smart and charming or have capabilities, but I set myself up in a series of abusive relationships. Um, I worked, I went to school, I did a lot of things when I was changing, you know, and it could just happen. And um, I went to college for two years for social work and human services, I got all A's. I went to college for administrative, you know, uh, medical transcription, I love medical stuff, you know. So I was trying to grow within this whole system. But what I'm getting to is that I sort of had a revolution within my own head. I mean, I was going through all these different people that were sort of or different, I call them disassociates. And, and so what happened was, as I realized I was in so much pain because I was really self-destructive, and that's what happens to peoples in a society when they are experiencing so much pain as we are now. People are beginning to become more aware, we hope, and the idea of this is to raise awareness. They're be beginning to be more in touch with themselves and maybe with what's going on. Some of the younger people here probably have a great deal of shock to sort of be in college and think that it's going to be like it was when their parents were growing up, where there were jobs, more, more jobs, you know, and things were sort of in a comfort zone. So I see young people as facing, going through a mourning period and sort of waking up to this like, wow, will I have a job when I get out of college? Will I be able to pay my student loans? And as you know, the right wing of our country is going through, a, you know, they're reactionary. And they infuse religion into politics, which is the patriarchal hierarchy thing. And um, they have the state laws. The state laws evolved to support.
support the very wealthy ruling elite, and we see our rights and shrinking. They're shrinking every day. Uh, they whittled away at the very essence of a woman's rights, which is control of her own body. Her right to choose. Her right to say, I mean, even in the LGBT community, their right to adopt a child. Their right to, you know, have marriage uh, issues. You know, you know, be, have, have the same advantages that a heterosexual couple does. And then we go to the rights of what about mandatory sterilization and eugenics, which was about picking the most fittest, which would probably be white males, to let's go ahead and just, you know, have mandatory sterilization to get rid of a certain population that we don't want, that we think is inferior. And so, you know, we see all these, you know, and even under Bill Clinton, here's the biggest problem I see. I think one thing we as socialists have to realize is that the Democratic Party also, you know, a lot of times it's vote for the lesser of two evils. Like, okay, I'm not going to vote for them because if I vote for them, you know. But the problem with that is that we are still voting for the same thing because the Democrats have moved to the center and the right wing has moved even more reactionary as it's infused religion and politics. But it's all really done for power and wealth and control. Because we all know about the Koch brothers who put Scott Walker in Wisconsin with their money, because it's money behind politics, and how he tried to what? He tried to get rid of collective bargaining. But thank God the workers rose up. And, you know, at least, you know, replace two of those or three of those people. Thank God for that. So you see how the, the wealth and the power is the big key here, and, what, and how it stays in the hands with the reinforcement of the state and the reinforcement of you know, um, the police, and even the military and the police. I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with that in Berkeley, there was a lot of police brutality when Occupy hit the streets. And I had a couple friends there who really got, actually got hit by those batons. And, um, you know, they were among thousands of students who were rallying about the exorbitant fees that they're charging in college. So, as, so I look at the young people and I think, wow, if I was young then, you know, now, now I would be like, wow, if I was in college and I was thinking, I want, I, I'm looking forward to having a job and teaching, you know, I mean, you know what they're doing, the public sector jobs. And, and so I, I would think, wow, I want to have a job and I'd like a family. I mean, people are putting, families are changing now. And, you know, they're putting off, they're putting off marriage. There's different types of families. The nuclear family has disintegrated, is disintegrating. I mean, there's what, there's a 60% divorce rate. I mean, there's class antagonism within that, too, because of patriarchy and abusive men who want to have the power and control. They're cutting back on welfare. When Clinton got rid of AFDC in 1996 and introduced TNAF, if you all remember, you know, that was about temporary assistance to poor needy families. It really didn't do much good. It was supposedly welfare to work. And um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Overall, um, the, the sense of patriarchy, the sense of power and control, been beginning from the evolution of class society as it evolved and put the surplus into the hands of men, and then read oh, you bad men, you, <laughs> and put it into the hands of men, and you realize that it's really um, come to a point where we're having now we have speculative capitalism, where they're making money off our money. And what happens with that? Oh my God, we're a bank, you know, I hate to say it, but the debt crisis, I'm not sure that it exists. And all the money that could, for wars, could be going for women. We are half the population, women. We should have more than half the sky. And that's a book, by the way, about, you know, world, um, what is it called? Um, institutional violence and cultural violence. But um, we should have more than half the sky. And I think what's important is for we as women to stand up and start to have consciousness raising groups like Mary Mother Jones, who I so, was so excited when I heard she talked or was in this building, to stand up and start developing consciousness groups where we talk to one another and we talk about these issues. Maybe we plan some direct actions like the Million Woman March in 1970, which was really because they didn't want Bush to stay in office in 2004. But we need to sort, sort of work towards coming together and looking at the problems, thinking of direct actions. And I'm not saying it's, that identity politics is the answer. 
That's one thing I'm not saying. Because within this sea of capitalism, there is Naomi Watts who thought that women should become corporate leaders too. And, you know, she wrote about power feminism. Well, I would get, I personally don't want to compete with men on that level of greed and corruption. I think we need to care about our sisters, and we need to care about our brothers, and we need to come together and look at it, talk about it, brainstorm ideas, come up with direct actions, help women within the community, think of whatever we can do to begin to change it. Because we are either headed towards barbarism, or to, we are to either barbarism, even fascism exists as a possibility. We, it's like when I change from my DID, okay, that revolution inside me, it was either Barbara, I change or I die, and I say to you all, it's either we change things or that's, you know, we can die. I mean, are we, you know, because our basic needs are being met. Okay, I'm sorry if I was a little discombobulated. Thank you very much.
about that. When I walked out of that movie, I felt really militant. And I felt like, my God, it, it, the patriarchy that goes through the top to the bottom. Even the economic advisors, like Hank Paulson for Bush and uh, Geithner, these people worked at Goldman Sachs. It is so amazing how the hierarchy just, you know, just runs through in there, you know, the brotherhood of men. And I'm not saying that all men are bad. I just think that the, the classism and the patriarchal control by men tends to lead to, since the power and control are in the hands of these men, tends to lead to abuse, because capitalism is based on a system of exploitation. It, we need, they need people to oppress. And the black people in the 60s, from the Civil Rights Movement, we remember what happened there. We know how Jim Crow and how the Ku Klux Klan and the white male supremacists, that attitude, the white Aryan and Hitler, and you look at it and you see this broad picture. I'm just trying to make a sort of a paint a historical picture of what is, you know, how the overall system has evolved to this point. And we're really at a critical point. So anybody, I'm, I'm hoping somebody would like to say anything about anything. Go ahead. I just have a question. Sure, if I can answer. Um, <laughs> just one thing, what, what things have women and men done to, I mean, in what oh, ways have they done to, that, that has actually brought, because certainly from like 1957, right. women, it's gotten better. Yes, so yes. What, what tactics have they used and what social things have they It's great. So, you know what? I forgot to talk about the feminist movement. And there was old feminism with German, German Greer, which was more men against women. That kind of thing. Forget that it's more gender related. Let's go into the women's feminism of the 60s, which was the, well, the first wave was the women getting the right to vote. Yay! And then it was, that ended in 1919 with the constitutional amendment that said women have the right to vote. And, uh, but then the second wave was like the movement of Betty Friedman and uh, uh, Gloria Steinem. That was a movement that did help to raise women's rights to um, the level of at least upper class women could go to college, or middle class women, and they would start, they started to teach more about women's history, calling it herstory, and they started to make, women started publishing books more. Up till that time, it was mainly men who defined this in both through books and history, but they started talking about women more and what women could do. And this was a time for women where they could learn study teaching and they could study the you know professions and they could rise you know up more as far as making money and survival. And um, so I guess what I'm saying is that that was pretty much um, a very exciting time and I don't want to reduce the significance of women's gains in the professions as you were talking about. Also, when we got Margaret Sanger, the development of Planned Parenthood, I mean, that, that was really important because she, um, in 1870, are any of you familiar with the Comstock laws? Okay, those, those were laws that said that abortion and contraception were illegal, okay? And that they were obscene. And so what happened was Margaret Sanger, when she got involved, she, her consciousness rose because her mother, had 18 pregnancies and only had 11 children and died at the age of 40. So she started, and she worked with immigrant women who were having these illegal abortions. And so um, she really had a tendency to feel for, you know, she felt compassion. And so she started getting involved so that she opened up and began Planned Parenthood, which provided, and that's shrinking. That's very important what you brought up, because right now, we're at a time when they're starting to whittle away at our rights. And you know what those rights, some, I mean, they're like parental consent, mandatory waiting periods, and there's states like Mississippi that are trying to do away with it altogether. But without the right to control our bodies, I mean, taking care of children and working, being a part of the working class, is very difficult. And, you know, where there's no socialism and no provision for daycare, no provision for health insurance, no provision for uh, doctors or any kind of services from the government to help women so they can go out and work, how are they supposed to do it all? And have, okay, I'm sorry. But did I kind of give you some of the, I know it was a really important thing I forgot and put in there, and I'm glad you asked me those questions, because we have, there have been gains, but now it's receding again. Like in Europe, Europe where they have some socialism programs, like they have, you know, have a doctor in community, they have national health care, they have daycare, it's totally Denmark's the happiest country where there is equality. 
And so in those communities, Denmark is the, supposedly, they had half socialism, they were half their way there. But it was reduced to, now it's going back to a fourth the way there. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on this oh, as well. I think um, go ahead. There were other things. that um, the gains that have been happening over the last 50 years um, have been primarily reforms. And so when you're doing reforms, you, you basically, a lot of women have now been allowed into and allowed to compete in this broken system of capitalism where before they previously had been excluded from it. But that doesn't fix capitalism. Adding women to capitalism doesn't fix capitalism. Um, and so while there is, you can see benefits, certainly, from those reforms, um, until it just is, is shifting sort of who is excluded. So women who choose not to, as you were saying, compete in the man's or be as vicious and as greedy and as you know, so women who, who don't want to become like that form of capitalism are still um, excluded. Um, because we haven't transformed the system, we've just added women, women to a broken system. In a personal way, that's what happened to me. I mean, I grew up basically in the 70s and the 60s and 70s, and I, there was something, I, I just didn't, I couldn't relate to feminism. Because I didn't want to think that we would go and be as cutthroat as men were. And it's only as I've grown up and understood what the women's movement has done for me that I, you know, but I still shy away from that because, you know, I don't, what is it you're talking about? I mean, I, I don't want to be like that. I don't think men have to be that way. I don't think anybody has to be that way. That's why so we see socialism as the only way because that would create a system of equality without the class antagonisms and equal rights. Um, and they called it a petty bourgeois, radical feminists called that a petty bourgeois movement. Desiree, I'm going to add a little bit of what Stephen said about uh, capitalism and consumerism. Mm -hmm. I don't think people acknowledge enough the oppression that they put on women currently. Because now they, the things that they throw at us every day, the things they throw at men every day, labeling is fine, what we're supposed to look like and who we're supposed to be and how things are and then, you know, we buy into that because it's in our face constantly and then you're oppressing yourself from what's in your head and, you know, you're, whether you're big enough or you're not big enough or whether you have the right clothes and your hair looks right you know, you're always in competition with yourself and other women or with men or and you look at what happens there and you see like she was talking about these cutthroat type of women that are coming out and now want to be from the right and want to run for office and look at what they are and what they find themselves as. Um, you know, I think that capitalism and consumerism is more detrimental than just the blatant oppression of a man controlling the world. Oh, I agree 100%. In fact, I had a whole section on that that I forgot to put in in my outline, but I, I just totally agree because, you know, the sex, it also goes to the sex, sexism that women are creatures and women that don't have what they, like, okay, I'm getting older and when I see women on TV with the young skin, my thing to say is, um, oh my God, maybe I need Botox. You know, it's kind of, it feeds on that vanity and that feeling that who I am is based on who you are on the outside. Yes. Exactly. Okay, your turn and then your next, okay. Um. And kind of to continue expanding on the uh, reform comments that he made, I mean, one thing that we need to understand is that a system will only give a solution that continues to reify that system. Capitalism will only provide an option that maintains capitalism, patriarchy, etc. And then a lot of the reforms that, you know, uh, feminist movements and uh, LGBT movements and uh, the civil rights movement got were through the legal system. And it kind of, it, we need a dual, more than dual, but we need a multifaceted approach because legal change cannot lead to cultural change. And, you know, despite legal equality that has been guaranteed through numerous uh, different laws to different minority groups, it's cultural that uh, perpetuates racism, that, perpe you know, perpetuates this patriarchal, patriarchal system and allows it to be maintained even though we've got, uh, you know, legal equality. Yeah, the laws can't bring it, you know. It. 
we had slavery, then we had the emancipation, and Jim Crow came in. We got rid of Jim Crow, and now we have a system of mass incarceration that is used to uh, subject. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up, because black men and immigrant men and, many, and mentally ill people that are homeless are going to jails now instead of having shelters for them. Yes, and that's a big money, and that lady in Arizona, Jan Brewer, she is lobbied by a big corporate prison thing. I'm sure you all probably know that. So yes, that's a big issue. I thank you for that. Anybody else? And there's as much you? crime. Oh, there's I'm as sorry, much. I apologize. There's as much crime in white communities as there is in black communities. Sure. It's just that the media and the political oh. focus says, "Look at this crime problem we have in the ghetto. Look at the crime crime problem we have in this neighborhood." But we ignore the fact that there's just as many white kids doing drugs. There's sure. more white kids doing drugs. I want to make sure on time because I don't want to infringe on the group, the Palestinian group, the panel that they're setting up. That is important because you are a woman, and I need to respect that. We all because there is sexism in women too. We compete. We look at each other like like Desiree said. We've got to get rid of that. We are all together. Ruling really class women may not care about the black immigrant woman. I do. I hope you all do. In the, okay, and go ahead. Oh, I, I just want to thank for bringing up the, the book by Angel's Origin of the Family, Private Property and State. Because oh, I think because I mean really I mean that shows us the way that basically that Marx and the philosophy looks at all these questions and looks at it you know, as a material basis. You know, not whether it's you know, national oppression or women's oppression mm -hmm. or the question of the so-called third world or anything else. Right. It looks like you know, based on what kind of material basis it has. Right. And any, all forms of oppression, in the end, they have material justification. One of the things, I like to use this quote, but it's, it's from Marx that said, whenever, whenever scarcity and want exists, all the old crap is provided. Because when there's, when there's not enough to go around, it has to be divided up. And that's how you get to the division inside of the classes and things like uh, 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 sexism, racism, all the rest. But in the end, the only way you can get rid of that is to basically, like we were talking about earlier, is to, is to struggle to get the whole of the surplus. The only way you can do that, though, is not on the basis of capital. And even what was just being said about the forms, it's also the ability of the capitalists to even offer those. Like the 60s, they were able to offer those things because you saw that post-war boom, right? Right. Because the United States basically had uh, beaten the other, uh, I've seen you know, the same That's how we got out of the depression. Right. And they exported and they made a lot of money and all the rest. So